Welcome students to chapter 11, which focuses on how our genes that provide us our heredity and our inheritance are sort of regulated and controlled by the body. Um, so we're gonna look at sort of three main topics, which is the control of gene expression. So we're gonna talk about what gene expression is to begin with. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, how cloning works, uh, both in plants and in animals. Um, and then we will discuss sort of the genetic basis of cancer, um, which is sort of uncontrolled growth. Um, we are going to start with the sort of first big idea, which is how uh, living organisms uh, control and regulate the expression of their genes. Um, so when we're talking about gene expression, essentially what we are talking about is that flow of information that we discussed um, in chapter 10, whereby we take the genetic information encoded in our DNA and we first turn it into messenger RNA and then we build a protein from that um, instruction in the messenger RNA. So essentially what we're doing is we're sort of going from our genotype to our phenotype and we're sort of flowing that information that way. Um, and so generally that's what we're talking about when we're talking about gene expression. Um, conversely, gene regulation is sort of how we control gene expression. We turn some genes on, we turn some genes off, um, some genes turn on at certain times, some genes turn off at certain times um, in sort of a controlled process. Some genes turn on and off um, based on sort of the environment around them. And so one of the ways that living organisms adapt um, and respond to sort of changes in their environment um, is by uh, gene regulation, by sort of changing the genes that are expressed in their body. Um, this happens even in very simple prokaryotic organisms like the uh, rod-shaped bacteria that you see here on the screen. Um, so typically um, genes um, in uh, prokaryotic organisms uh, get regulated via what we call an operon, which is essentially sort of the genes that regulate um, sort of several related enzymes or several related um, pieces and, and traits. Uh, they get kind of controlled together. And then um, what will typically happen is you'll get some sort of regulatory protein that will sign, sort of bind onto um, sequences of DNA that um, are part of the operon that sort of control whether or not the other part, other other parts of the operon sort of get turned on. So let me give you an example here. So um, when the operon is turned off, um, lactose, um, which is a, a sugar molecule, is absent in the body. And so here, um, these regulatory genes, right, this part of the DNA that codes for this particular repressor protein, without the lactose, the repressor protein gets made and is active. It, it is sort of now a, a functional protein. Well, the repressor protein binds onto the operator part of the operon, because here's the operon, the promoter region of the DNA, the operator part of the DNA, and then here is the genes that code for whether or not this organism can actually use lactose. Well, when the repressor protein binds onto the operator, um, it sort of renders invalid the rest of the operon because the RNA polymerase by which we would make the messenger RNA that would take the information encoded in these utilization genes, it, it now can no longer sort of do that. It can't bind to the promoter region and we can't have transcription taking place for um, the proteins that would allow the organism to use lactose. Um, conversely, when lactose is present, um, we still get these regulatory proteins sort of turning on that make these repressor proteins, but now lactose can bind to the repressor and it sort of inactivates, turns off the repressor protein, the regulatory protein. Now that frees up RNA polymerase to bind on to the promoter region of the operon and thus um, give us some transcription taking place and ultimately some translation um, 
to make some enzymes that allow uh, an organism like this to actually do something with the lactose molecule in terms of um, yeah, using it for, for energy. Typically that's what we use carbs for, is for energy. Um, so here is um, sort of another um, kind of look at that. So here the repressor is activated, right? Um, here is the lactose that sort of inactivates that repressor, makes this regulatory protein sort of not work. Um, here is sort of another um, operon. Here we have an active repressor when the molecule tryptophan binds onto it. And here we have an inactive repressor without the tryptophan. Um, and so we can um, sort of turn on and turn off our genes by the production of these regulatory proteins and whether the regulatory proteins themselves are sort of active or inactive. Um, now, of course, our chromosome structure, um, of course, sort of how we make modifications to, um, say, different transcripts that are made, all of that can affect gene expression. So the, the process by which a um, two-end zygote, so the, the result of the sperm and egg fertilization, um, it goes through mitosis and becomes sort of this multicellular organism. Even though all the cells start off the same, we get this huge differentiation in terms of multicellular organisms, right? Um, the leaf part of the plant is different than the stem part of the plant, which is different from the flower part of the plant. Um, or if we were talking about an animal, right, um, the muscles are different than the nerves and are different than the fat cells. Um, Cells within multicellular organisms have different structures and function. The process, even though they start off all the same, the process of that happening is called differentiation. And how that happens is that some genes get expressed in some cells and some genes don't get expressed in some cells. And by sort of selectively activating and sort of transcribing these different genes, by doing some selective gene expression, um, we're able to get this great diversity in terms of cellular structure and function in multicellular organisms, even though all of the cells have the same DNA, right? If we're looking at a, a plant or a fungus or an animal, right, any sort of multicellular organism, it doesn't matter what type of cell it is in that organism. It could be a nerve cell, it could be a muscle cell, um, it could be a leaf cell, it could be a stem cell. Um, they all have the same DNA for that organism, but they still have all this great array of diversity in terms of their structure and function due to selectively um, expressing their different genes, expressing the genes. Um, and so, um, DNA sort of in the nucleus it exists at, sort of as a cluster um, in these kind of attached to these little proteins called histones and you get sort of this string of it almost looks sort of like um oh my goodness um if you're ever a little kid and sort of made a little friendship bracelet and had those little beads um that is what DNA sort of looks like it's what we call a nucleosome and um it's normally in that sort of fibrous kind of chromatin format and then just during mitosis it kind of all condenses up into an actual chromosome. Um, when we modify the DNA either in terms of the DNA bases or the histone proteins we get something called epigenetic inheritance uh, meaning we've made some sort of modification to the original existing DNA. Um, DNA it, in the nucleus tends to get like really packed uh, fairly tightly um, and so sometimes that can lead to sort of um, it's almost like it's it's so packed in there that you can't access it um, and so sometimes um, you get uh, sort of a uh, an inactivation of genes just because the transcription 
molecules sort of can't get in there. We can't get the DNA polymerase or the RNA polymerase sort of in there to access a particular gene. Um, uh, for instance, um, you know, sometimes in the cells of female mammals, um, the X chromosomes sort of get inactivated. And so here you can see, um, here is that double helix DNA. You can see here's the little histone proteins, and you can essentially see here's the nucleosome, sort of this little bead-like collection of the DNA itself sort of wound around the histone proteins, um, then connected by little linker proteins. And um, most of the time, it's sort of this loopy kind of fibrous um, chromatin, but then when we go into um, mitosis, it kind of all bunches up into um, what we think of as a chromosome. And so we can change the bases of the DNA, right? We can get some sort of mutation that way, or we can change these histone proteins, and either one of those things would result in um, sort of chemical modifications and epigenetic inheritance. Um, so for instance here, um, this is the sort of um, that X sort of linked um, inactivation. So here are um, some X chromosomes. Here's the allele for orange fur. Here's the allele for black fur. The cells divide. Um, and what ends up happening is the active X protein will contain the allele for orange fur, the inactive X protein will contain the allele for black fur, um, or you can, might get something where the inactive X chromosome is carrying the allele for orange fur, and the active X chromosome is then carrying the allele for black fur, um, and that's how you end up with um, some cells that are expressing sort of black and some cells that are expressing orange um, and you're getting sort of that calico pattern that you see um, on our little kitty cat here. So for instance, um, every single cell in your body, right, um, they all have the same genes, same exact DNA in a nerve cell than in a skin cell even though nerve cells, which have these sort of long arms, are very different than these short little flat scale-like skin cells. But the nucleus of a skin cell is exactly, exactly, is exactly the same DNA as the nucleus of a nerve cell. How is it that we end up with such difference in their structure and function? Right? That's the selective gene expression that we've been talking about. Right? We, the skin cell will activate some genes on the DNA, the nerve cell will activate a different set of genes um, in the DNA and on the chromosomes, and that allows them to differentiate and to become structurally and functionally different. Um, there are a huge, um, huge number of uh, regulatory proteins that um, sort of turn on and turn off the transcription of eukaryotic genes. Um, and, and prokaryotes, it's, it's that operon um, process, uh, which is a little simpler in, in eukaryotes as, as in most things when you compare eukaryotes versus prokaryotes. It's a little more complicated. Um, but here um, you have um, what are called transcription factors. And transcription factors are sort of... Um, they kind of make it easier for RNA polymerase to bind to a particular gene, so to transcribe that particular gene. Um, so you can have something like um, these enhancer regions in the DNA, of course that promoter region is of course where we always want to start, and you can see these little activator proteins um, and all of these sort of other transcription factor proteins um, end up sort of grabbing onto the enhancers um, and that allows the RNA polymerase um, to sort of grab onto the DNA, uh, grab onto the promoter region um, and transcribe that gene sort of much more easily. Another way we can end up with a huge difference in terms of um, 
sort of gene expression is RNA splicing. So remember, after the RNA transcript is made, um, it can sort of be cut up, right? We'll cut out the, the non-coding portions of it, but when we put it back together, we can put it back together in different ways. So we can splice the RNA transcripts in different ways. Um, and you could have the same mRNA transcript that sort of gets cut up in different ways and then spliced back together, put back together in different ways. And you can get multiple sort of messenger RNA molecules, even though you sort of just used the same initial transcript, um, transcribed from the same initial gene. Um, and in fact, in, in humans, um, uh, about 90% of our protein coding genes um, will go through different um, sort of splicing um, processes. So for instance, um, we have about 21,000 genes that code for more than 100,000 polypeptides, 100,000 different proteins, even though we have 21,000 genes. And that is because we're using some of the same genes over and over to make the same transcripts, but then we splice those transcripts in different ways. So for instance, um, here, right, we're going to pull out the the introns uh, and pull out the exons, sort of the, we want the, the coding bit, not the non-coding bit. Um, so we'll, we'll pull out the, the introns, the, the sort of non-coding pieces, and keep just the coding pieces. Um, but we can splice it so, several different ways. We can splice it uh, sort of this transcript, or we can splice it together to have this transcript. And this bit of mRNA is going to code for something different than this bit of mRNA. And so even though we initially had um, sort of the same RNA transcript from the same uh, DNA molecule, we end up coding for two different proteins um, because of sort of the different ways in which we can splice the mRNA transcript. Um, how much a particular protein gets made uh, will depend on how long that mRNA can last in the body. Um, so for instance, uh, if we're talking about the COVID vaccine mRNA, um, which of course is viral mRNA, um, it only lasts in the body a, a, couple, a, a, couple, of, um, a couple of days. Um, so I, you know, one of the things that keep people are... Um, I keep hearing about people who are vaccine hesitant is that we don't know the long-term consequences. Um, well, your body actually recycles um, and breaks down the mRNA um, from the vaccine quite easily uh, and quite rapidly. It does not like sort of hang out and around in the body for a long time. Um, but sort of how long the mRNA lasts um, can affect how much protein we get made. Of course, if it's got a longer lifespan, we're going to make more protein. Um, and then also, um, sort of what other factors are involved in translating that mRNA um, into a, a functional protein? Because sometimes um, some proteins sort of need to get activated, even sort of once they're made, um, they have to get activated. Um, and then, of course, it, just about everything gets recycled, right? Uh, things wear out, and your body tends to break things down and try to reuse as much of it, as much of what it made as it can. Um, so here, for instance, um, you can see this is for um, insulin. Um, and initially, when um, insulin is made, um, it is sort of inactive. Um, so even though we made it, we got it, it's sort of not functional at this point yet. Um, and it's really not until uh, it gets sort of folded over um, and we get these uh, linkages between the sulfur groups um, and the molecule itself sort of gets cut in two um, that you get the active form of insulin, which can lower um, blood sugar. And so, for instance, if the enzyme that cut and cleaves the sort of inactive enzyme and turns it into an active enzyme, if we were to deactivate that enzyme, um, then the insulin could, the sort of initial inactive insulin could not be split, um, and thus the insulin would still um, sort of be in that sort of not usable inactive state. Um, and so even in these sort of really late stages of gene expression, even after we have um, sort of proteins already made, after we've done transcription and translation, um, 
sometimes we need sort of further modification. And if that modification doesn't happen, um, then those genes are, are essentially not being expressed because they're not functioning. Their products that result from them are not functioning. Now, I think I mentioned this um, when we were talking about DNA, either last week or the week before, um, uh, only a very small portion of our entire genome for humans actually codes for proteins, um, which is true of a, a lot of multicellular organisms. Um, uh, but uh, there, there's a huge number of sort of junk DNA and um, bits of other sort of evolutionary DNA. Um, and then, of course, there is a small percentage of DNA that codes for the ribosomal RNA and the transfer RNA, sort of the other sort of things that we need to actually have translation take place. Um, and there has been some recent data uh, that suggests that pretty much sort of the rest of our genome um, is sort of transcribed into these functional but non protein coding RNA is what we call sort of micro RNA and micro RNA molecules will bind either to proteins um, or to mRNA and can essentially sort of block uh, translation or degrade the mRNA such that the end result is that there is no sort of expression of a particular gene. So let me show you what that looks like. So here you can see here is our um, here's our little micro RNA. Here is our uh, protein. You see the micro RNA is sort of binding onto the the protein. Um, right, we're getting sort of a, a again sort of that complementary sequence. So here the micro RNA is binding to the mRNA and essentially breaking down the mRNA. Well now our mRNA can't be transcribed um, because, or excuse me, can't be translated because it's in pieces. <laughs> um, or the microRNA, again, um, it might, what it might do is sort of bind onto like part of the mRNA, um, which then sort of prevents the mRNA from binding onto a ribosome um, and translation from occurring. So even though we have this mRNA that has been transcribed, uh, we can't actually translate it and express that gene because um, we can't build a protein anymore. Um, so there are um, sort of multiple mechanisms um, in eukaryotes um, that regulate gene expression. Um, some of this occurs in the nucleus, some of this occurs in the cytoplasm, um, so it's sort of not just one way that we regulate gene expression in um, complex multi multicellular eukaryotic organisms, but it's sort of lots of ways. So let's take a look. You can see, um, you can sort of think of it like, um, uh, sort of like the, the flow that you see here um, with the, the valves, right? So you kind of have to turn on all of the valves in order to kind of keep the flow of information occurring. And if we don't sort of turn on those valves, um, then um, sort of the information flow is going to stop. So of course we have just the unpacking of the DNA so that we can access the, the different genes. That's sort of the, the first turn of the valve. Um, then of course we have transcription taking that DNA and coding it into uh, mRNA. Then we have the splicing um, and the different ways that we can splice. Then we have the addition of the cap and the tail. If that doesn't happen, then the mRNA is not going to function properly. Um, does the mRNA actually fit through and escape the nucleus through one of these little nuclear pores right here? Um, that's sort of another turn of the screw. Um, once the mRNA is out in the cytoplasm, um, does it stay together? Does it uh, maybe get grabbed onto by one of these little micro RNAs and broken down? Or does it actually get translated into a polypeptide? And then once we have that polypeptide, um, does it get cut? Does it get modified? Does it get activated? Or does it get broken down? And so, um, you know, how do we how we end up with a functional 
active protein, full gene expression, there's sort of lots of ways that um, we can kind of turn it on or turn it off happening at sort of all these different stages in terms of the information flow um, from unpacking the DNA all the way to making sure that the protein itself gets folded and activated properly. Um, and again, there's sort of not just one place where we have to turn the wheel, um, there are multiple places in this process. There's sort of multiple steps that have to happen, and if that doesn't happen, then um, even though we may have gotten some far in the process, we may have an mRNA, we may not have a functional protein, and thus not the, the kind of true gene expression. Um, I'm going to end this first lecture uh, right here because um, we're going to talk about uh, fruit flies here for a second. Um, but before this lecture gets too much longer, um, we're going to stop it. We're still in sort of the first part of Chapter 11, um, but let's, let's end it right here for right now. And then we'll come back and jump into Section 11.8.